Uh, to take us back uh, all the way from session one to today, we've covered four main focus areas. Uh, the first looked at disaster risk reduction and conflict prevention. We then turned on to what could be common challenges and, and shaping common solutions around environmental peace building. Then managing climate change induced migration within the African continent. And finally today, looking at collaboration between Africa and Europe in the climate security nexus. So I'm sure you can all agree with me, that's a wide range of themes and topics uh, interconnected. So uh, the one thing that I won't do in the next uh, 12 or so minutes, I won't use the word mitigation, I won't use the word adaptation. I'm going to assume that you all understand what these mean, but when I finish, you'll know why I've purposely chosen to exclude these words in, in, um, in my final remarks for, for this uh, session. So some of the key issues. We speak to questions related to the disconnect. This disconnect is not only between the African Union and the European Union as uh, the main uh, continental bodies uh, that cover the issues related to climate, security, migration, environmental peace building, anything else that you can put into this basket but it really speaks to substantive disconnect as well. In conversations where security uh, is placed, often you find security experts, peace experts, peace building experts. You don't find the environmentalists or the climate experts in those conversations. You don't always find also the migration experts. So really important uh, work that is being done by all these different people is often siloed. The Potsdam Spring Dialogues has tried to bring some of those people together to hear those perspectives in the same room at an equal footing, with the view, hopefully, that we can disentangle the complex issues. But also, we look to the disconnect between political and policy frameworks and perhaps a reality check on the ground. Do these policies actually respond to the needs on the ground? Can they be implemented? And if they can, by whom, when, and how? Do policy makers engage with practitioners on a regular basis to be able to uh, address some of these key challenges and, and, and opportunities that we've identified over the past four sessions? Do they speak to each other enough that they understand what the other needs and what the other would require in order to be able to address these issues? Finally, context is almost presumed. When you speak about the Lake Chad Basin, Mozambique, the Sahel, the Horn of Africa, it's almost presumed that climate, conflict, migration interconnect. It's presumed such that people then don't really look to the granular analysis, to the perspectives on the ground as to whether or not this nexus exists for all as it does for individuals. So it's almost a tough ask, right? Here we are, a lot of researchers, policy practitioners, uh, people working in the field, and I'm basically asking you to take a step back and look at whether the things that have worked before can work for some of the challenges that we're facing. What are these challenges? It's a complex web of interactions. It's climate combined with governance, inequality, racism, xenophobia that can lead to social tension and unrest. It's a nexus between climate change and conflict. Not always clear, but sometimes very apparent. It's the nexus between climate and displacement, but also climate and voluntary movement and perhaps planned and, uh, and voluntary relocations as well. It's about thinking outside the box and looking at where things have worked, how they have worked there, and who it was that informed that change. Was it local communities? Was it the regional economic communities? Was it the African Union? Was it international partners? 
The regions that I've spoken about, be it EGAD, the Lake Chad Basin, the Sahel, Southern Africa, all confronted with different, but perhaps the same challenges. The solutions, obviously, would be tailored. People need to be paid to respond to these and plan for them. So it's beyond conversations like this and really rolling up our sleeves, if I can put it that way, to be able to really deal with the issues. It's about understanding the impact conflict zones, but because climate doesn't choose, quite frankly. When there is flooding in Mozambique, Malawi, Zimbabwe, as a result of series of cyclones, when there's droughts in areas in the Horn of Africa, parts of Southern Africa, the Lake Chad Basin and the Sahel, it's not selective in terms of the geography in which it impacts. And so responses shouldn't be as selective as well. And then we need to think about ways that we can integrate peace building initiatives to efforts to understanding first and then responding to these climate issues. What can we conclude? We can conclude that links, however unclear, do exist in some contexts, that extrapolations can be made around climate and security, climate and migration, climate and development, but also security and migration, migration and development, development and security. So this is a web of many interconnections. What that means is, again, where I started, you need to bring different people into the room. You need the lenders of the world who are climate experts, who may not necessarily be working on security issues, but whose advice informs how those that are working on security, on migration, on development can be able to shape better responses. You need to be looking at short-term as well as long-term interventions but also some that are circular interventions as well. You need to identify, as has been done by some studies, hotspots, so that we can be able to use those as areas that we can intervene immediately, but also that can help shape responses in areas that are not necessarily in a precarious position. We need to understand that there are layers of fragility and that in order to do that, we also need to do what I said earlier, take a step back, assess, look at the context, don't assume it. What then are the key actors? What are the agents of change? Local communities, women in particular, have been seen to respond to issues on the ground. I have purposefully, as a woman, not mentioned gender across my analysis because it shouldn't just be about singling out a particular avenue in which women, young people are involved, but understanding that everything that I've said so far needs to be addressed by the community. And the community is 51% women. In Africa, the community is over 65% youth. So they have to be integrated in the responses because, like it or not, they are impacted just as much. We are impacted just as much. Local authorities, chiefs, community leaders, national actors, whether in different government departments, regional actors, drawing on innovations from EGAD, from, SAP, from the Southern African Development Community, and then also looking towards the African Union. But the last session we just had tells us something. Africa can't do this alone, not least because a lot of the climate impacts that we are facing are not of our own making. Africa needs to work and collaborate with our neighbors, but the greater global community as well. That means incorporating these analysis into the engagements between Africa and the European Union, but also Africa and our other neighbors, whether we're split by an ocean to our west with uh, the Americas or to the east with Asia. We need to be able to have those partnerships beyond the ones that exist, but also, as we've heard, it's not just about talking about it, it's actually practically about implementing the actions that we discuss. Finally then, 
few bullet points and I'll end. Action needs to be targeted and there have to be specific actors for those roles. We need to understand the complex linkages and the complex disconnect as well. We need to think outside the climate box and outside the security box and look to ways that we can connect these. It may even come from the African continental free trade area and freedom of movement. It may come from leveraging remittances and rethinking reintegration and re relocation. It can come from any of those spaces, but if we don't explore them, we won't know them. Angelica and the team from the Potsdam Spring Dialogues who've organized one of the most interesting events that I've been at. Um, my 13 minutes is up. Thank you very much.